Good morning, boys and girls. I'm glad that you could join me this weekend as we learn something in our faith in the risen Lord Jesus at this beginning of the season of Advent in the church year. Now, how long do we have to go until Christmas time? Anybody know how far, how many more days until Christmas? And I'm not really talking about shopping days. And what's one of the things that you'd like to do at Christmas time with your family, maybe, in preparing for Christmas Day? Do you make some special Christmas cookies? Do you uh, set up some Christmas decorations, maybe a Christmas tree? Well, what is Christmas really all about? Well, I've got a storybook here that I'm going to read, and it's called If You're Missing Baby Jesus, something that sometimes some uh, Christians put up in their homes at Christmas time is like what we have here in the church at Christmas time, a nativity set. In the depths of a bitterly cold December, my mother decided it simply wouldn't do to go through the holidays without a nativity set. It was 1943 in a small town in North Dakota. My father worked for an oil company during my growing up years, and we moved around to several different parts of the state with his job. At some point between one move and another, we lost our family's little manger scene. Happily, mother found another at our local five and dime store for only $4. When my brother and I helped her unpack the set, however, we found two figurines of baby Jesus. Mother frowned. Someone must have packed this wrong, she said, counting out the pieces. We have one Joseph, one Mary, three wise men, three shepherds, two lambs, a donkey, a cow, an angel, and two baby Jesus. Oh dear, I suppose some set down at the store is missing a baby Jesus. Hey, that's great, Mom, my brother said with a laugh. Now we have twins of Jesus. Mother wouldn't have a bit of it. You two run right back down to the store and tell the manager that we have an extra Jesus. Oh, Mom, go on with you now and tell him to put a sign on the remaining boxes of the nativities saying that if a set is missing a baby Jesus, to call us, 7162. Mom smiled, and I'll give you each some money to buy some candy. And don't forget your mufflers, it's freezing cold out there. The manager copied down my mother's message, and sure enough, the next time we were in the store, we saw his cardboard sign. If you're missing baby Jesus, call 7162. All week long, we waited for the call to come. Surely, we thought, Someone was missing that important figurine in their nativity set. After all, what was a nativity set without the main attraction? Each time the phone rang, my mother would say, I'll bet that's about Jesus. But it never was. With increasing exasperation, my father tried to explain that the figurine could be missing from a set anywhere. Minot, Fargo, maybe even Walla Walla, Washington, he said, for that matter. After all, packing mistakes occur all the time. He suggested we just put the extra baby Jesus back in the box and forget about it. Back in the box, I wailed. What a terrible thing to do to baby Jesus. And at Christmas time, someone will surely call, my mother reasoned. We'll just keep the babies together in the manger until we find the owner. That made my brother and me happy. It was special to look in that little manger and see two Christ children side by side gazing up into the adoring eyes of their mother Mary. And was that a surprised look on Joseph's face? But the days went by and no one called. When we still hadn't heard from anyone, by five o'clock on Christmas Eve, my mother insisted that Daddy just run down to the store to see if there were any sets left. You can see them right through the window over the counter, she said, if they're all gone, I'll know someone is bound to call us tonight. Run down to the store, my father thundered. Ethel, it's 15 below zero out there. Oh, Daddy, I said. We'll go with you, won't we, Tommy? Tommy nodded vigorously. We'll bundle up good and we can look at all the decorations on the way. <sighs> my father blew it a long sigh and headed for the front closet. I can't believe I'm doing this, he muttered. Every time the phone rings, everybody yells at me to see if it's about Jesus. And now I'm going off on the coldest night of the year to peek in some store window and see if he's there or not. Dad muttered all the way down the block in the cold, still air, while my brother and I raced ahead 
to the store. The streets were empty and silent, but behind each lighted window, we knew that families were gathered around Christmas trees and manger scenes and fireplaces and tables laden with tasty holiday treats. I was the first to reach the store window where colored lights flickered along the edge of the frosty pane. Pushing my nose up against the glass, I peered into the dark store. They're all gone, Dad, I yelled. Every set must be sold. Hooray, my brother cheered, catching up with me. The mystery will be solved tonight. My father, who had seen no logical reason to run, remained quite a distance behind us. When he heard our news, he turned on his heels and started back for home. Inside the house once more, we were surprised to see only one baby Jesus in the manger. Where was his twin? For that matter, where was mother? Had she vanished too? Dad was unperturbed. Someone must have called her, he reasoned, pulling off his boots. She must have gone out to deliver the figurine. You kids get busy stringing up popcorn strands on the tree, and I'll wrap your mother's present now. We'd almost completed one strand of popcorn when the phone rang. You get it, Gene, my father called. Tell him we already found a home for Jesus. My brother gave me a quick, eager look. Our mystery would be solved at last. But the telephone call didn't solve any mystery at all. It created a much bigger one. It was my mother on the phone with instructions for us to come to number 205 Chestnut Street immediately. Bring three blankets, box of cookies, and some milk. My father was incredulous. I can't believe this, he groaned, retrieving his boots for the second time that evening. What in Sam Hill has she gotten us into? He paused. 205 Chestnut Tree. Well, that's eight blocks away. Wrap that milk up good in the blankets or it'll turn to ice by the time we get there. Why in the name of heaven can't we get on with Christmas? It's probably 20 degrees below zero out there now. And the wind's picking up. Of all the crazy things to do on a night like this, it's Christmas Eve. Tommy and I didn't mind at all. It was Christmas Eve. And we were in the middle of an adventure. We sang carols at the top of our lungs all the way to Chestnut Street. My father, carrying the bundle of blankets, milk, and cookies, looked for all the world like St. Nick with his arms full of goodies. My brother called back to him. Hey, Dad, let's pretend we're looking for a place to stay, just like Mary and Joseph in their adventure that night. Let's pretend we're in Bethlehem, where it's probably 65 degrees in the shade right now, my father answered. The house at 205 Chestnut turned out to be the darkest house on the block. One tiny light burned in the living room. The moment we set foot on the front step porch, my mother opened the door and shouted, They're here, they're here. Oh, thank God you got here, Ray. You kids, take those blankets into the living room and wrap up the little kids on the couch. I'll take the milk and cookies. Ethel, would you mind telling me what's going on here? My father huffed. We've just hiked through sub-zero weather with the wind in our faces all the way Never mind all that right now, my mother interrupted. There's no heat in the house. This young mother doesn't know what to do. Her husband walked out on her. Those poor little children will have a very bleak Christmas, so don't you dare complain. I told her you could fix that oil furnace in the jiffy. Well, that stopped my father right in his tracks. My mother strode off to the kitchen to warm up the milk, while my brother and I wrapped up the five little children who huddled together on the couch. The distraught young mother, wringing her hands, explained to my father that her husband had run off, taking all the bedding, the clothing, and almost every piece of furniture. But she'd been doing okay, she said, until the furnace broke down. I've been doing washing and ironing for folks and cleaning the five and dime store, she said. I saw your number there every day on those boxes on the counter. Then when the furnace went out, that number kept going through my mind, 7162. Just call 7162, 7162 said on the box that if a person was missing Jesus, they should call you. So I figured you must be good Christian people willing to help folks. I figured maybe you might even help me. So I stopped at the grocery store tonight and called your missus. I'm not missing baby Jesus, mister, because I surely love the Lord, but I am missing some heat in this house. Me and the kids ain't got no bedding and no warm clothes either. I got a few Christmas toys for them, but I got no money to fix the furnace. It's okay, Father said gently. You called the right number. Now, let's see here. You've got a little oil burner there in the dining room. Shouldn't be too hard to fix. Probably just a clogged flue. I'll look it over, see what it means. My mother came into the living room carrying a plate of cookies and a tray of cup, cups with warm milk in it. As she set the cups down on the coffee table, 
I noticed the figure of the baby Jesus, uh, the twin that we had, lying in the center of the table. There was no Mary or Joseph, no wise men, no shepherds, just baby Jesus. The children stared wide-eyed with wonder at the plate of cookies that my mother set before them. When the, one of the littlest ones woke up and crawled out from under the blanket. Seeing all the strangers in the house, his face puckered up, and he began to wail away crying. My mother swooped him in her arms and began singing to him. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Mother crooned as she sang, but the child still cried. Haste, haste to bring him, Lord, the babe, the son of Mary. She went on singing, oblivious to the child's crying. She danced the baby around the room until finally, in spite of himself, he finally settled down. You hear that, Chester? The young woman said to another one of her children. That nice lady is singing about the Lord Jesus. Jesus ain't ever going to walk out on us. And why he sent these people to us just to fix our furnace. And blankets, too. Now we got blankets. Oh, we're going to be warm tonight. Jesus saves. That's what he does. My father finished his work on the oil burner, wiped his hands on his muffler. I got it going, ma'am, but you need more oil. I'll make a few calls tonight when I get home, and we'll get you some. Yes, sir, he said with a sudden smile. You did call the right number. When Daddy figured the furnace was going strong once more, our family bundled up and made our way home under a clear, starry night. My father didn't say a thing about the cold weather. I could tell that he was turning things around in his mind all the way home. As soon as we set foot inside the front door, he strode over to the telephone, dialed a number. Ed, this is Ray. How are you? Yeah, Merry Christmas to you too. Say, Ed, we kind of have an unusual situation here tonight. I know you got a pickup truck, and I was wondering if we could round up some of the boys, find a Christmas tree, you know, and a couple of things for... The rest of the conversation was lost in a blur as my brother and I ran into our rooms and began pulling clothing out of our closets and toys off our shelves. My mother checked through our belongings for sizes and selected some of the games she said might do. Then she added some of her own sweaters and slacks to our stack of clothes. You know what? It was a Christmas Eve like no other. Instead of, instead of going to bed in a warm, snug house, dreaming of a pile of presents to open on Christmas morning, we were up way past bedtime, wrapping gifts for a little family we'd only just met. The men my father called found oil for the furnace, bedding, two chairs, three lamps. They made two trips to 300, 205 Chestnut Street before the night was done. And on the second trip, he let us go too. Even though it must have been 30 degrees below by then, my father let us ride in the back of the truck with our gifts stacked up all around us. My brother's eyes danced in the starlight. Without saying anything, we both knew Christmas could never be the same again after this. The extra Jesus in our home hadn't been ours to keep after all. He was for someone else. A desperate family in a dark little house on Chestnut Street that we could help. Someone who needed Jesus as much as we did. And we got to take him there and so much more. This is a true story, boys and girls. The love of God given to us in the baby Jesus changes our lives, and God seeks to work through you and me and our families to touch and change other people's lives too with the great news of his love in Jesus. May his peace be with you.